Yes, I'm Kevin Scaldaferri. Um, I am an engineer on the uh, architecture team at the Guild Group. Um, you know, I'll be talking about microservices and how we use Scala there. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, um, Guilt is the, uh, the leading US flash sale for uh, designer clothes and uh, other upscale goods. Uh, we operate primarily uh, men's and women's clothing, but we also sell uh, home goods. We do travel deals and local restaurant deals and things like that as well. Um, and we really have two major uh, technical challenges that we're facing. Um, one is a, a rich feature set that we're supporting. And, you sort of get a taste of that on the screen. Um, you know, the, the sales are, are personalized and they're optimized for each customer who's coming in. Uh, there's also a bunch of other stuff on here. There's, you know, account credits. We have a loyalty program, internationalization, uh, notifications, promotions. Um, and this only really starts to scratch the surface. Um, uh, the customer facing stuff is really just the, the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole uh, back office set of functionality behind this as well. So uh, lots of uh, features that we're supporting. Um, and then uh, the second challenge is that we have a traffic pattern that looks like this. So this is a flash sales site. Uh, and every day at noon, we send out emails uh, about the sales that are going on that day. And a huge stampede of customers come to the site. Um, so we need to keep things up and responsive in the face of traffic like that. So uh, Gilt is, is about six years old. And uh, in the start of the company, it was uh, implemented as one really large Rails application. Um, so this is sort of a taste of, of how big things got uh, eventually. And uh, you know, as, as that application grew, and as our traffic grew, uh, as the number of engineers that we had grew, uh, a number of problems start to manifest with that type of architecture. Um, there weren't really clear lines of, of ownership. Um, you know, Rails encourages you to just throw everything into one directory, so a thousand models all in one directory, a thousand controllers all in one directory. Um, the dependencies between those pieces were, uh, they were complex and not very obvious. Uh, the testing and release cycle would take multiple days. Um, and uh, really the worst part is that uh, even after going through testing, we could find uh, performance impacts in production that, uh, that weren't detected because we just can't throw that sort of load at things uh, in our, in our uh, test environment. Um, so there were some, uh, some bad production issues that uh, as a result of that, we started looking at ways to improve things. Um, and that's when we started thinking about microservices. Um, and we started by converting a couple of, of really core uh, critical pieces over into microservices, things like the inventory management and shopping carts. Uh, and over time, we've moved more and more into services. And uh, this is a graph of the, the growth of services over the past four years. Um, today, we have uh, over 300 services and small web applications in production. Um, and all of our new development is done in this uh, service-oriented architecture and using Scala. Um, so in the course of that period of time, uh, we've established you know, a set of practices that, uh, that really support this, uh, this type of, of architecture um, and the uh, development and operational foundations uh, to, to help people. So we have, uh, we have four cornerstones of this infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the build system, configuration, testing, and continuous delivery. Uh, and then that gives us the foundation for people to, to build things and you know, our, our real goals, which is to have cool stuff for our customers. So uh, first foundation component is, uh, is SBT. Um, so, SBT uh, began life standing uh, for the simple build tool. Um, and then a lot of people complained that that wasn't really accurate. Um, so it's now the Scala build tool. Um, but it does have a very steep learning curve, uh, a fairly complex mental model that you have to understand about your builds. Um, and configuring everything correctly can be tricky, 
uh, particularly if you're you know, pulling in a lot of plugins and such into your build. Um, and we, uh, we try to isolate most of our developers from having to think about that. We would like them to just be writing application code. So in order to do that, uh, we developed a, um, a large SBT plugin which, uh, which pulls in all of the other plugins that we want to make use of that other people have written. Um, and then it adds in a lot of custom functionality that we've created that's specific to our environment. Uh, and then provides a standardized configuration for everything. And then once we've done that, uh, we actually make it really simple for, uh, for individual services and libraries to configure their build. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is a complete build specification for one of our libraries. Um, I have not deleted anything in preparing this slide. Um, so this, you know, this just has uh, the, the type of project, the name of the project, and list of dependencies that it needs. So this is you know, the absolute minimum that you could possibly have in the build specification. So, um, and we've gotten it you know, this simple for people. Um, for, uh, for services, the build specification is a little bit more complicated, um, and that's you know, primarily uh, a consequence of our philosophy that we want to bundle together um, a service RPM together with a uh, client library that people can use, um, and then we have a, a core library that has the common data types. Um, but again, you know, this is still pretty simple. Uh, project type, name, um, and in this case, you have to have three lists of dependencies because you're uh, creating three different artifacts. Um, and then behind all of this, uh, this plugin is actually providing um, a huge amount of functionality to people. So very simple build file, um, a lot of power that people get behind, uh, behind that. And I don't have time to go into uh, the details of all of these, but just a flavor of what's, uh, what's happening. So piece number two, uh, configuration and configuration management. Um, so we construct our configuration in layers. Uh, all of the common and default configuration is provided by a Zookeeper cluster. And then uh, each service for pieces that they want to add or alter, uh, they can do that in uh, local YAML config files. Uh, and if you really want to uh, override things on a, like the level of an individual process, you can pass in system properties as well. Um, and then that uh, layered config gets mapped into strongly typed classes and uh, validated using Hibernate. Um, and if the, uh, if the config doesn't match up with what the service is expecting, it will fail on startup. So you never get configuration errors uh, once the server is up and running. Um, and this is a, an example, again, of what this looks like. So this is um, a Scala case class uh, representing configuration where we have a, um, just a host name that's a non-empty string, uh, a port number that's an integer in this allowed range. Um, and so that's a pretty a simple example of, uh, of a configuration object. There's a little bit of syntactic grossness here, which is um, sort of an impedance mismatch between Hibernate and Scala. But um, overall, this is, this is pretty compact and works nicely for us. Uh, next piece is testing. So um, testing is really one of the most challenging parts of, uh, of a microservice architecture. Um, full functional tests are really the, the gold standard for testing, but uh, developers can't run you know, 300 services on their local laptop. Um, unit tests we can run quickly and locally on a laptop, but uh, once you start having to mock out interactions with lots of other uh, subsystems, um, that can get really painful and tedious. Uh, they can be fragile as things are changing. Um, and if you're not careful, you over mock things and then you're not really testing anything at all. Um, so the, uh, the approach that we've developed to dealing with this is a way that we write tests that we can run in two different modes, both as functional and as unit tests. Um, and this makes use of, uh, of the cake pattern. Um, and uh, so the cake pattern is difficult to summarize quickly, um, but I'm going to try. Um, and uh, so um, 
it can be thought of as something like a, uh, a safer form of dependency injection, which uses mixing composition and, and the type system to guarantee that, that everything is wired up correctly. Um, so it allows, you know, when you uh, have an abstract base class or a trait, um, you can specify basically as part of the type of that object things that are going to have to be mixed in to uh, concrete subclasses of that eventually. Um, so things like object repositories or configuration providers or you know, many other things can be, uh, can be done in this way. So um, one way in which we make use of this is in our, uh, our client libraries talking to other services. So this is a little bit simplified, but um, it fits on slide now. Uh, so, so this uh, self-type here is basically saying this is the requirement that you have to provide a configuration uh, into, this, into this factory before it'll work. So uh, when we're running normally, what we would do is we would mix in that configuration system that I was just talking about a moment ago. Um, but when we're testing, we, uh, we mix in a different, uh, a different configuration provider. Um, and this has got some, some magic built into it. Um, and now uh, we can take this, this test client provider um, and we can start writing tests with it. Uh, and I'm not going to actually show the tests, but uh, just sort of the, so an abstract class using that. And this is actually abstract because there's one more piece of the cake that we haven't uh, put in yet that's required before you can make this concrete. And, uh, and then we actually do that in three different ways. So we end up mixing in uh, three additional traits, uh, functional, capture, or mock. Um, and these classes actually, they have no content um, in them. All of, the, all of the test code is up here in the abstract class. Um, and shared amongst all of them. The only difference is this last trait that we mixed in. Um, and now uh, this actually ties into one of those features in the build system, and we can actually select what type of test we want to run. Um, so if you run SBT functional test, that uh, runs just the one that mixed in the functional test, and it runs against the full stack of services. Uh, if you run capture test, uh, it does the same sort of thing, but it captures all of the responses that came back in, and it saves those into the file system, and then we commit those into Git, and we have them available in the future. So that then when you just run a standard unit test, it actually replays those captured responses back in. Um, so this is um, pretty powerful. It works uh, quite well for, for solving this, this problem of testing. Um, so that's what we do for services. Uh, for testing UIs, um, we make use of Selenium. And again, we've built this as an extension into our build system, so you can run it from, uh, from SBT. Um, and it's built on top of the Scala test uh, DSLs for Selenium. Um, and then we've added a whole bunch of our own components for doing different types of, of actions. Um, and again, uh, we end up being able to use Scala's type system in a, in a really nice way here. So um, this is, uh, again, a sort of abbreviated example um, and still somewhat complex. Uh, but the thing I want to point out is um, these, these traits that are mixed in that are in bold here. Um, and these are actually test fixtures. So, you know, whereas normally test fixtures uh, we would put down, uh, you know, in the body, uh, in the description of our tests, um, we've actually lifted them up into the type system, which gets us some advantages because you can actually uh, express you know, prerequisites, uh, dependencies between one fixture that needs to be there for another, or maybe some of your test code really is not going to work unless a certain fixture has been run. And by pulling that up into the type system, we can actually guarantee those sorts of constraints. Um, so, and, and this is using something called the stackable traits pattern. Um, so one of, these, uh, one of these fixtures looks something like this. And uh, the, the thing that's sort of interesting and non-obvious is that this, uh, this super call here doesn't actually resolve to this super class up here. Um, so Scala runs on the JVM. Uh, it doesn't really have multiple inheritance. 
Uh, so in instead, it sort of fakes it. These, these things that look like multiple inheritance, there's a uh, trait linearization process that goes through. So it's actually a, a, a very deep single uh, inheritance tree. Um, and the consequence of that is that those super calls are actually just resolving up this stack. Um, and so actually the test fixtures run in order uh, according to how they were uh, stacked in here. Um, all right, so um, that's testing. Uh, we move on to the last piece, which is continuous delivery. Um, and uh, so we've built a system that we call Ion Cannon. Uh, this is our continuous deployment uh, pipeline. And it, uh, it fully automates all of our testing and all of our uh, deployment processes. Um, and what this lets us do now is that when we're actually ready to uh, cut a new version of some, uh, of some service, a uh, developer uh, can just run SPT release, and that packages everything up, injects it into the pipeline, uh, runs the tests, and if everything passes, then five minutes later, a new version of your service is out in production. Um, this is a dashboard that we have um, where people can look at this. You can see where things are in the pipeline and what's been deployed recently. Um, do some stuff like canceling and retrying things if you need to. Um, and uh, this is actively used now, and we deploy uh, 20 to 30 new service versions a day using this. So, uh, so that's all of our foundation pieces. Um, I have a few minutes left where I can now show off a little bit of cool stuff that we build on top of this. Um, so this is an example of something you might see when you're shopping on our site. Um, these badges telling you uh, how much inventory is left for, uh, for various items. And uh, these aren't just loaded uh, when you first open up the page um, and static. Uh, they actually update in real time. So if, you're, if you have one of our sale pages open, you'll actually see these numbers change while you're looking at them. And you know, in countdown, three, two, one, everything's reserved, an item is sold out. Um, and so you know, this, this creates excitement and urgency and the sense of competition between, uh, between the shoppers. So you know, we're trying to get people feeling like you know, they're going to a really great Black Friday sale or, you know, or they're at a live auction um, where they're really engaged in the shopping activity. Um, and, and building this sort of stuff, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, so we're using, we're using Play. Um, and that uh, provides a WebSockets implementation um, and, and Aka actors. Um, and so, so implementing this, um, this diagram captures most of it. Uh, so, you know, so what happens, um, you know, a person comes in on their browser and they open up a page, and that opens, that opens up a, web, a WebSocket. Um, and these are managed by play, uh, and, and basically it's abstracted. So this is a, an iterator or iterity and enumerity pair. Um, and then we wire that up to an actor. Uh, and so each user is associated with an actor, and that's keeping track of what they're looking at right now. Uh, and then this, we have this master actor, which is receiving updates off of a message queue. Um, so it gets in updates to, uh, to inventory. It fans them out to all of the individual actors. Uh, they decide is that actually relevant to what the user is looking at right now? Um, and if it is, uh, pushes a message back out through the WebSocket and updates in the browser. Um, so that's neat. Uh, but um, it gets even cooler uh, in something that we call a free fall sale. So this takes that sort of inventory countdown, and then we add a Dutch auction on top of that. Um, so uh, the implementation is fairly similar, um, except a, a couple new pieces to get added in. Um, and I have a video capture of what one of these looks like, which I'm going to play now. Um, so we're seeing here, when you come into this, so it starts, we're seeing a countdown until the sale starts. The sale starts, and prices start showing up, and people start shopping, and we start selling out of things, and these are counting down. And as time passes, you'll see at unpredictable intervals, these prices start dropping, right? So now you have a decision to make up. Oh, only three of these left now. 
Um, so you have a decision. You know, if I like one of these items, how much do I like it? Right? Do I want to buy it now at this price? Right? Or do I want to wait and let the price drop a little bit longer, but then someone else might get it ahead of me? Um, uh, that is a very fancy uh, vintage Hermes purse. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, no, the price is so the price is lower on a on a schedule. It's it's not predictable to the to the users, but it's it's not it's not random either. But it's just sort of on a on a timer. The prices drop. So so if you're willing to pay the current price, grab it now. You know, if you want to try and get a lower price, you can wait. But someone else might snag it ahead of you. Um, and uh, people really, really like this. Um, this is one of the most, <laughs> one of the most popular new features that we've added to the site in the last uh, in the last year or so, and and people go crazy for it. So, people who buy sixteen thousand dollar purses at this site. <laughs> um, so that's uh, that's pretty much what I've got today. Um, I've covered the uh, you know foundations of of what we're using to build uh, to build the microservices on top of some of the ways that we're using Scala, taking advantage of Scala, um, and then some cool stuff that lets us build. Um, and I think I have one or two minutes for questions. In the back. Can you talk Right. So, um, okay. So, question about uh, some of the other parts of uh, sort of more operational or uh, production sides of things. Once once it's out there, um, so we're not using any type of service discovery. Um, that that Zookeeper cluster uh, keeps information about uh, like what ports various things run on, or you know how how a uh, the client library for a service you know needs to needs to find. Uh, that service. Um, so, uh, during, let's see, um, log aggregation. Uh, honestly, at the moment, we do not do a very good job with that. Logs are just out on uh, individual machines currently. Um, that's, like, that's something that we're actively working on right now, uh, trying to get some centralized collection of logs. Um, I think, so sort of in the, the, the context of how, you know, the company has developed and how our technical stack has developed, um, one of the things which is really nice about Scala is that in a certain way it um, combines some of the, the good parts of when we were using Ruby and had this very concise expressive language. Um, but then we get you know the type safety and the performance because um, so some of the very early services were actually done using Java, um, and that was great for performance and reliability, um, but it was sort of painful to work in coming from the uh, dynamic language, uh, coming you know coming from that direction. Um, so Scala has gotten us back into being able to write very uh, concise and expressive code, but you know we get the performance of the JVM. We get an even better type system than Java has, um, so that's you know so that's been I think a big win just in terms of uh, expressivity and and reuse of, of components. All right, uh, we've got one more Uh, so we would expect each service to uh, to maintain um, backwards compatibility in its API until you know until they can ensure that all of the clients are are also upgraded. Um, so so you might you know just uh, you know we'll have a version number typically in the in the paths that requests are going into. So if you're going to make a an incompatible change uh, in part of your API, you need to bump that version in the path, and you need to keep the old version working at the same time, um, and then 
you know, and then and then hopefully we can relatively quickly update, uh, you know, everywhere that's using uh, that's that's a client of that service. Um, but you do need to make sure that you maintain backwards compatibility at least for a, a period of time. 